Welcome everybody to another wonderful episode of our Wellness Warriors today. I'm super excited about a very special guest. Most of you know her as a eighth season co-host on Dancing with the Stars. She also was a host on Entertainment Tonight. She's an Emmy winning entertainment journalist and TV host. So I know she sounds so important, doesn't she? <laughs> So beautiful, beautiful Samantha Harris is with us. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. I know you're a busy woman, but what I'm you know, so attracted to you about and so grateful for is the fact that you're a health advocate, you're a wellness enthusiast, you've written an amazing book called The Healthiest Healthy, and was actually named by People Magazine a top 10 health and wellness book of 2018. So that's amazing. That means you've impacted a lot of lives. But today you're here as a woman, like any other woman out there who's been diagnosed with breast cancer. You're a cancer survivor and thriver, and you've done some amazing things to help with breast cancer awareness. Your nonprofit organization called Gotta Make Lemonade inspires positivity to people. So we'll get into that in just a minute. So thanks for being with us, Samantha. Thank you, Dr. V. I am so happy to be here because I love so much what you and I both are trying to get out into the world, which is helping people live their healthiest life. Um, you obviously focusing specifically on breast cancer, but really the things that we talk about in both of our books are really in line with each other because the ways that you want to help prevent and fight breast cancer are the same changes and adjustments that you make in your life to ideally fight and prevent other chronic diseases like heart disease and type 2 diabetes and even other autoimmune disorders. So uh, it's, it's really great. We are very symbiotic. Absolutely. Absolutely. So your, your pain and what you went through, as most women, often becomes our passion, as it did with me. So uh, tell us a little bit about your background history and how you came to find out that you had breast cancer. Absolutely. Well, I was uh, just about to turn 40 and I was in the best shape of my life, the best health of my life. I had my two little girls with my husband who were three and six at the time. And I thought, you know, let's get a jump on that mammogram thing. Let's set a baseline while I'm really healthy so that we can notice any changes that might ha occur in the future. And I got that mammogram and I, the results came back and they were clear, which is exactly what I expected. But 11 days after that clear mammogram result came back, I was changing after a workout and I found a lump. And I thought it was so strange because that lump definitely had never been there before. I immediately called my time OBGYN. She had me come in a couple of days later. She did a quick clinical exam, assured me it was nothing and sent me on my way. So most of us would have said, great, all good, go on with our lives, keep on living, and, and don't think about it again. No. But a month later, it was still there, and I thought, you know, I should get a second opinion. Now, not thinking it was breast cancer at all, I went to see my internist. He was equally non-concerning, said, well, if you're worried about it, we'll keep an eye on it, and sent <laughs> me on my way. And then it was the holidays. It was like Christmas time and the new year. So before I got, took my head above water again, four months had passed since I got that clear mammogram result. The lump was stubborn. It was still there. And I thought, you know, all right, let's go look at it with, through the eyes of someone who looks at breasts every single day and they know what they're looking for. Still didn't think it was cancer. And I saw a surgical oncologist um, at a breast center here in Los Angeles. She even didn't think it was cancer. However, she used all the tools at her disposal. She did a needle biopsy, two ultrasounds, an MRI, all within the same day or two. And the results from that needle biopsy came back. And it was so interesting when she saw me a week after I initially went in for that needle biopsy. She walked into the room and she said, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is it's not cancer. But the bad news is, I don't know what it is. So you know what? Let's just take it out. It's a proliferation of cells that, that did not detect any cancer. So I had a lumpectomy, woke up from the lumpectomy still, no cancer. And a week later, went by myself because I told my husband, hey, you don't have to come to the you know, follow-up <laughs> exam. We already know it's not cancer. Go play golf. Literally, I said, go, go golf. It's a gorgeous day. And I went and sat there by myself as my surgeon 
with a heavy heart told me that it was not only ductal carcinoma in situ, which um, for of course your, your breast cancer um, survivors uh, who are listening know that that is that cancer that's just contained within the duct and not smart enough to get out, but I also had invasive breast cancer. And my world crashed down at that moment, blindsided by something I never thought was going to happen. Um, having lost my dad to colon cancer, was just 50. My girls being young, my husband being in his mid 40s, um, I thought this is, this is not a good thing. Um, and that was really the, the beginning of an incredible and positive journey. Because positivity, and you touch on this so much in your book and I do in my book, is such an essential part of survival and resiliency. And um, I'll let you jump in here because I could keep talking for 20 minutes straight and you'll say, wait, wait, I didn't get another question in. I used to hate when I would do interviews at entertainment and I was a celebrity. And you ask them one question and you're hoping you have, you know, you have 10 minutes for an interview and you're hoping you get three or four more questions in and they eat up the whole time and the publicist says, and we're done. So continue. I'm so sorry. That's okay. That's okay. We'll take as long as you want. Now, so two things out of your initial experience. Um, so great, great message for women out there, which is you know, part of why I'm so passionate about my breast friend, because you may get a mammogram, you may get an ultrasound and go on your merry way and think you know, everything is fine, but if your gut is telling you that something isn't, it doesn't feel right, you know, to pursue it you know, like you did. You, know, you just kept going doctor after doctor and you know, that, can, that potentially saved your life. So you know, get to learn the normal geography of your breast tissue and my breast friend really helps you distinguish what normal is and what abnormal is. And then secondly, I love what you say in your book about a battle versus a journey. You know, like you said, your father died of, of colon cancer, and we know what traditional treatments can do to people. And, you know, like you said, he didn't really embrace the journey in the same way that we did. But, you know, back then, things were a little bit different. You know, my, my father died of pancreatic cancer, and, you know, he was gone in, in six weeks. So talk, let's talk about oh the gosh. difference between... Let's talk the, about the difference between uh, a battle and a journey and, and how that approach is so different and can be, make a, a big difference in the outcome of our journey. Well, I think you know, you're hitting the nail on the head with it is a semantics thing, clearly. Um, when you have the right mindset, and it's a survivor mindset, it's a resilient mindset, that basically takes everything and really turns it on its head in a positive way, with shines that positive light um, on it. Because when you approach things with that idea, here I am, I have breast cancer, okay. Um, I can be devastated, but it, I also can't, can allow it, can choose to allow it not to devastate me. And there's a, a nuanced difference there, right? So if I approach everything with positivity, and I'll give you some examples, it changed my perspective so much because in those first two weeks post-diagnosis, I was riddled with anxiety in a way that I had never felt before, a physical manifestation, manifestation of anxiety. Um, and I knew that it was, I, I had that, thankfully I had that insight somehow just, it, maybe that again, that listening to your inner voice, the same thing that told me with my gut, hey, get this checked a second, a third, and finally, you know, we discovered it was cancer. But listening to that inner voice that said, I have to change in this perspective. I have to flip the script. And so that everything that came at me next was attacked with a positive veracity. Um, uh, and with that, uh, some examples are, all right, I have cancer. And it's uh, Positive self-talk is an amazing tool, and I talk about it a lot in the book. I mean, give examples, and some of those examples are this. You have cancer. Okay, well, what's positive in that? Well, um, sorry. Um, well, uh, I caught it early. Great. Keep listening to that positive script. What else is positive? Okay. Well, um, I've got great health care insurance. Excellent. Keep going. I have a wonderful support network. I'm in otherwise healthy fit shape that will help me reduce my chances of uh, complications and surgery and will help my recovery be faster and all these other incredible elements that were positive. My situation was a lot better than other people who have gone through something similar. Um, so just even having that change of perspective, this isn't a battle. This is a journey. 
and it's going to have highs and lows and I have to ride the waves and know that even in my low moments, they're, they're temporary and they will pass and I will get through it and I will be better for it. That's amazing. I mean, that, that is so true. If, if we can look at the diagnosis and know that, you know, we're, we're working, the cancer doesn't define us, right? The cancer is not like when, when we coach women and at the retreats, women say, well, my cancer or my tumor is like, no, 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 no. Don't own it, right? That it's the cancer because, you know, you are not the cancer. You, you may be a body that has the cancer, but we're, we're working with you, the whole body, not just the, the cancer itself. So big, big distinction there. Now, absolutely. Now, in your book, you talk about, you know, you have eight different pillars and, of course, nutrition and exercise. Yes, I read it on Kindle, but if you have a copy there. Well, this is, this is actually, I should have a better copy, but this is, this is the early, but it's in full color uh, on the inside in the real book. Uh, but this is your healthiest healthy, and it, it really is those eight easy ways to take control, help prevent and fight cancer and live a longer, cleaner, happier life. And I'm so happy to be able to share it. We also have expanded, and we can talk about this a little bit later in the interview, but um, I've expanded to not just have the book, but similar to you who does retreats, uh, we, are, we just launched the Your Healthiest Healthy Retreat. Uh, the first one, which is in October during Breast Cancer Awareness Month, is benefiting Susan G. Komen. So for every attendee, we're donating $100 um, in their name to Komen. I'm an ambassador for Komen, and they do such tremendous work. So uh, I'm really excited to be able to give back in, in that way and they That's do so awesome. much so, okay. so yeah. there you go. So, yeah. beautiful book and retreats are so important because of community right we all need community and we need to yeah. surround ourselves with like-minded women who understand us because unless you've walked in that path you know you don't really get it so it's important to surround yourself with like-minded women all right so in your book you talk about nutrition and exercise which you know we all know about and Talk to me about your realization of tame the toxins. When, what was that aha moment where you said, ooh, what am I putting on my skin and how is that impacting my health? Well, for someone who has spent a career sitting in a hair and makeup chair, being shellacked with God knows <laughs> what and spray high hell with chemical bombs, um, I was really oblivious. I mean, we all know our body is our, you know, our skin is our largest organ and we absorb everything. But I, that concept was really fell on deaf ears until I went through my mastectomy. And then every survivor I happened to come, you know, in passing with um, would say to me, have you changed your deodorant yet? I said, why? I mean, I guess I got a really sweaty pit. The girl who goes to the gym and I do not listen. I am like a drowned rat when I come out of there. I drip, I schwitz, I, you know, so um, I've always used these high powered deodorants that I, I never even stopped to consider what was stopping the sweat and the, st the stank, you know? Um, and they said, oh no, you know, the aluminum that's in the deodorants can really lead to breast cancer. Now, straight up asking my oncologist about that, Traditional medicine doesn't want to really acknowledge that. Right. And there haven't been enough studies to prove that. However, our body is meant to sweat out toxins. And if we are keeping our armpits from sweating it out in an area that is so close to the breast tissue, I don't know, for me, that gave me a lot of pause. Mm -hmm. But that switch in my deodorant, Dr. V, that switch was really the gateway for me to changing up everything and not overnight. I don't want to scare people. And one thing that I'm really proud about in my book is that it is all about small, manageable steps. Yeah. If we think we have to make sweeping changes overnight, a 180 on everything we're eating and everything we're putting on our body and every beauty, you know, makeup, we wouldn't do it because it's too overwhelming. And we're already overwhelmed by being in this survivor mode. So really it was bit by bit. First, I changed my foundation. I figure, okay, of my makeup kit, that's the one product that I'm putting on my entire face. So why don't I just switch up my, my foundation and then I'll keep using my, my shadows and blushes and all that until um, I can make the purchase for the next thing. And it was sort of a slow build of redoing my makeup kit and then redoing my hair care routine and my lotions and all the, the different beauty balms. And that then opened the door to, well, wait a second, 
I've got kids in my house. They're crawling around the floor and they're playing. What am I cleaning with? Because I was all about, you know, like just that perfect gleaming Lysol clean and, and everything and, and mm -hmm. my detergent. And so it was a real wake up call of how I started to slowly change things over. But we are so much luckier now in this day and age than even 10 years ago, because now we have wonderful companies that care about our health and realize the need and the demand for clean, toxin-free cleaning products, makeup, hair care. And, uh, and I, I list a lot of them in the book, and I'm sure you do as well, you know, in terms of on your site and everything that you give through your retreats. Yeah, yeah, no, that's awesome. It's, it's, you know, like you say, it's that one thing that can cascade you into thinking about, well, what about this? What about that? You know, because when you look at toxicity from an environmental point of view, we know that <clears throat> so many of the chemicals in the environment are, you know, chemical estrogens that are going to mimic and stimulate estrogen in the body. There's, you know, the things we have in our home, the things we put on our skin. I mean, all those things, you know, pile up together. Now, another thing you talk about in your book is about mastering your medical mojo. And I really appreciated that because it's about taking responsibility for your health and really creating that um, communicative uh, re uh, relationship with your doctors. Because a lot of women feel intimidated or they're afraid to ask questions, especially if they're dealing with traditional oncologists. So let's, let's talk about that and, and how um, you know, you, the, the things that you encourage women to do when they're working with their doctors. One thing I love to say is don't be afraid to doctor date. Don't be afraid to really go and sit down and have a meeting with that, you know, potential new doctor, see what their office policies are, ask questions, come armed with a list of questions, uh, because you need to be an empowered health advocate for yourself just like you need to be a power, an empowered consumer for how you're purchasing your food and your cleaning products and your makeup. So as an empowered health advocate, that means walking to the doctor's office and two things. One, no matter how much pressure you feel because, oh gosh, I got to get all my questions in really fast because they have 20 other patients waiting. Remember, this is your time. And that doctor is in the room for you to make you your healthiest healthy. And he or she can't do that if you don't take the time to slow down and ask the questions that are necessary. Do not let that doctor leave the room until you are satisfied that all of your questions and concerns have been answered. So some of the questions I love to ask are, uh, you know, it, it, and I kind of go through this, if you're doctor dating, if you're all you know, newly diagnosed, if you are uh, post recovery on a surgery, um, but some of the questions I love to ask are, how would you advise your own daughter? or your wife, if they had this diagnosis. Lean on your peers, other doctors, whether they're in your office or within your network, to assess what's happening with me and the best course of treatment for me. How much do you keep up on the latest studies? And I'll tell you, this is a very, this is a very important one. For, you know, doctors are busy, and I understand that the healthcare system has changed dramatically. My stepdad is a surgeon, uh, now retired, and I know how much he complained about just the back office stuff instead yeah. of the time with patients that, that is required now because of how the insurance companies aren't wanting to pay and everything. Um, but they are human, and they have only a certain amount of time in the day. If they're not keeping up with the latest research, that's a problem for you. And I'll tell you my personal experience with that. When I was meeting with uh, radiation oncologists to figure out whether or not I would need radiation post mastectomy, the first one that I went to, who was actually recommended by my surgical oncologist. So I thought, I mean, because my surgical oncologist is like, he came up, he was on the team of doctors that discovered the axillin node biopsy. I mean, he, I feel like so grateful to have been in his hand. But I figured anybody he hands me to has got to be you know, the best. And in that I said, you know, would you recommend radiation to your own daughter? He said, you know, I would, because if you don't, you'll have a 20% chance of recurrence, of local recurrence. And I said, I left that appointment going, well, I, I guess I'm going to have radiation. But I did get a second opinion. First doctor was at his own private practice. He's got to keep the lights on. Now, I don't think that he would have purposely tried to give you radiation just so he could pay his bills. However, 
I went over to UCLA. These doctors are salaried doctors. They don't have to worry about keeping the lights on. They're also up on the latest research. And that radiation oncologist sat me down and she said, I'm gonna tell you first, you don't need radiation. And now I'm gonna tell you why. She pulled out my file with all my details. And she said, your tumor size. Two recent studies, and this was now five years ago, but two recent studies had just, have just come out from MD Anderson and Sloan Kettering that take tumor size into consideration where the other studies that said you'll have a 20% chance of local recurrence did not. But these studies say that your tumor size, which is very, very small, will not be benefited at all by radiation. Let's just say I didn't have radiation. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful because also you can't ra radiate the same place twice. So I thought, God forbid, I ever need to go through this again. I still have the possibility of, of using radiation as, as a tool if necessary. Um, and I'm grateful that I didn't have it for all the other side effects that it can come with. Um, you know, sometimes we don't feel like we have that choice. And had, and had she confirmed it, then I would have gone through with it. But that's where asking your doctor questions and making sure that your doctor is up on the latest research is leaning on their peers for answers and questions and not just someone who thinks they are God and know everything because sadly we can't all know everything, right? Yeah. Um, so really knowing your doctor, taking, knowing having your medical mojo, knowing your what questions to ask and how to take control in that situation. Sometimes it means bringing someone with you to take notes because your mind is going like this and it's crazy and it's swirling and it, you, there, you feel overwhelmed. And so if you can have uh, a significant other a bad friend uh, come with you to take some notes and perhaps be a second voice to ask questions, that is also really beneficial. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Cause you're like a deer in headlights sometimes and they're talking and you're not absorbing half of what they're saying. So that's great. And, and what a great experience though, for your doctor to say, you know, the latest studies. That's so good to hear because you know she's up on, on the latest and she's taking the best care of you. Right. How about, um, there's no place like Ohm. <laughs> I thought that was really sweet. Oh. Yeah, that was a really sweet thing because, you know, one of the things that, that we teach our community that you can't heal if you feel like you're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, right? You've got to learn to calm down your nerve system, get into the parasympathetic relaxation mode, because that's what's going to keep that immune system nice and strong and healthy. So, so talk to me about your meditation practice and why, like, how did that, how did you make that connection with your journey? Well, I'm someone who is, I don't know if you've been able to tell this just through the interview, I'm a very individual. I'm really? always on the go. Boom, boom, boom. I mean, even when I was recovering in my mastectomy bed for three weeks, my hands were going crazy on my computer, creating my gotta make lemonade website. Like I couldn't stop. And there's something in that. And my, you know, it's funny. My mom always says, I think your jobs are what caused your cancer. She could have been right. I mean, I worked insanely. I didn't own my life. My, my, I mean, literally, I mean, I think people do oftentimes feel owned by their job. I truly felt like my, my life was owned by my jobs because it's specifically my entertainment news job. Um, not as, not as much uh, dancing with the stars because that was, you know, two days a week, finite weeks a year. I knew where I was going to be. There wasn't, there wasn't the unknown, but with entertainment news, it's always changing. It's, it's, it's news as much as it's entertainment, it's news. So, you know, it's last minute, get on a plane and fly overseas tonight. Um, oh, I'm going to be home, you know, to go pick up my kids at school or see their school play. Oh, well, guess what? You're not, you need to go to a movie premiere tonight. <laughs> Excuse me. And so that stress of being on call 24 seven, seven days a week, yeah. I think definitely um, challenging because then I was also always trying to tread water and fit in my exercise and make sure I was being the best mommy I could be and there for everything. Super mom, super wife, super homemaker, super you know, employee. And I'm not like, Ooh, I'm so awesome and super, but I mean, th but that was that pressure I was putting on myself yeah. was to be yeah. everything to everyone at every moment. And you talk about this and I love that you hit this on the nose in your book as well. You have to really assess where are you on the to-do list on that totem pole? Are you allowing time for self-care? And in that frame of self-care is where meditation has come in. And it's something I am still struggling to 
have as part of my daily practice. I would really like to be the person who sits for 20 minutes still and breathing. Um, and I, I, that is still, this is a journey. So that is still part of the ongoing journey. But I do take micro meditation moments. And to me, those have been really impactful. So that might mean I'm you know, running a few minutes late to, to get to somewhere and hit a, you know, a traffic jam. And now all I want to do is tear my hair out and just taking a moment to breathe and, and realize you can only control what you can control. Mm -hmm. I could have controlled leaving my house earlier, but maybe something else prohibited me from doing that. And now I'm in a situation where I'm stuck in traffic. My stress is not going to make the cars ahead of me move any faster, but I can control my response to it. And that's the, you know, really own moment of, of owning your, your meditative life in a way that you can be in touch with your parasympathetic response and you can really slow yourself down. And to me, that has been wonderful, whether it's, you know, 30 seconds or 10 minutes of deep breathing um, and understanding you can only control what you can control. It makes a really big difference. It does. It really does. And, you know, even that two minutes of self-care and <clears throat> meditation can, you know, change the whole rest of your day if you take the time to do that. So if there was... Oh, wait, wait, one more thing. I just want to say one thing too that I think is interesting about that is we, I oftentimes think that those moments of micro meditations need to be where you're by yourself or you're, but really it can be in the midst of a conversation. Actually, while you were talking, I found that I was getting really amped up because I'm excited to talk about this stuff. I'm passionate about it. Um, but it also it, it brings in this response am I, within me of ah, craziness. <laughs> and so I, as <laughs> when, when you took a moment to interject, I realized I needed to silently, without anyone knowing, have, I weren't talking about it, of taking that moment to just take a breath and call myself and, and it really, it's helpful. I'm sorry. There we go again. Onward, Dr. V. I give the floor to you. I love it. I love it. So if there was words of wisdom and parting words of encouragement that you would share with women that are, you know, just now diagnosed with, with breast cancer, or maybe have been on their healing journey for a while, what would you tell them? That you can take control in a situation and that feels completely maniacally out of control and be a huge part of your own healing journey and leading to your healthiest life possible, which to me is your healthiest healthy. Um, and the other part of that is to remember that there will be waves, waves of strong emotion, waves of physical pain, but those waves are temporary. They will pass. You will get through it. You will get to the other side. And even when you're on the side, some of those waves will continue. But you know by that time, wait a second, I was able to ride the wave back then. I know I can do it again and you'll be stronger for it. All about that resiliency. That's so awesome. Well, Samantha, you're a shining example of what a real thriver, conqueror, survivor is. Thank you for everything that you do to empower women and people as they go through various challenges. Oh, and we didn't talk about your um, lemonade. Gotta make, gotta make lemonade. Let's talk about that. Well, well, Gotta Make Lemonade was born out of me basically being in my mastectomy recovery bed and wanting to make you know, again, make lemons out of lemonade, turn something negative into a positive. And so my lemonade at the time was creating the Gotta Make Lemonade site. Since then, my lemonade has been finding my healthiest healthy and then writing the book, Your, Your Healthiest Healthy, so that you all can also become the healthiest you've ever been. But the website itself is an online community of shared stories to inspire positivity in the face of adversity, no matter, not just cancer, no matter what has knocked you down in life. And it's a great place to go. We also, uh, through the site, we're not our own nonprofit, but we feed to Susan G. Komen and other nonprofits um, through, the, through the site. So uh, I look forward to 
any of your listeners who have a story, whether it's dealing with their own cancer or something else in their life that they have turned into a positive, uh, sharing their story with me, submitting the story through the website, and I read everything that comes in, and then hopefully being able to share it with our online community. That's awesome. Wonderful. Well, thank you once again for your time. This has been a lot of fun. You're definitely lots of it, have lots of energy, very vibrant and bubbly, beautiful you. So thank you for all you do. Thank you, Dr. V. And I appreciate your book and your breast friend um, diagnosis helper. <laughs> I don't know what to call it. Like, tool, tool for finding loss. There training we go. Training kit. Training kit. There we go, training kit. So we all know how to check our breasts for anything that shouldn't be there. Um, and I, I hope that, that people are able to go on your retreats and enjoy them. I hope people will join me. My retreats are run a little bit differently. They're really small groups, anywhere from 10 to 15 people at a high-end resort and spa, all-inclusive with daily workouts, daily group coaching sessions, a lot of girl bonding and hanging out with like-minded people and making lifelong friends. So uh, I look forward to the, the one in October in uh, Utah and many more to come. So yeah, I'm sure it'll be fun. Yeah, really. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. And this is Dr. V sending you a big healing heart hug. Bye for now.